We are recording. Welcome back to another episode of these crazy fools that just keep eating me and can't stop talking about it. Today we got Janice back, we got Brooke back, and we got Coach Raymond back. And of course, me, Tom. I'm here. Justin is uh, on hiatus. He's busy moving or something. I don't know. But anyways, we're here, and today the the topic is what exactly is the carnivore diet? There's all sorts of confusing information out there, uh, lots of confounding factors, and you hear weird tidbits from people. Some people tell you you can only eat meat and water. Some people say, well, you can have some salt with that. Some people say it's animal-based, anything comes from animals. Some people say that includes honey from bees, and so on and so on. So we're here to hammer it out and tell you guys what the truth is, because if you got a carnivore card, it probably came from us, right? Maybe not. But anyways, what do you think, Jazz? What's your impression of what the carnivore diet is exactly? Oh, good question. Actually, I didn't pre-think about this topic because I thought, well, I'm going to see what everybody else says and and get just get engaged in the dialogue. But for me, um, so I'm 20 months into carnivore and for the first you know, 16 months, I was at 95% animal foods, right? And I would cheat around the edges and have that extra 5%. I was like, oh, I'm good. You know, I was experiencing a lot of benefits. So I just thought this is carnivore, you know, I mean, I'm whatever, having the random little chocolate ball, or I would sneak some carbs in here and there, but just kind of occasionally not super regularly. Um, so I feel like, you know, if you're a beginner, that could be, that's carnivore. Those are, as long as you're sticking to animal foods, you know, that's going to serve you. So I consider that carnivore. And then, but as I moved along in the journey, I automatically started narrowing down the foods. And at the end, I was kind of eating like five different kind of carnivore staples. And then now, as you all know, I'm just on, you know, ribeye and water, fatty ribeye couldn't do lean meat but super fatty Costco untrimmed ribeye so to me all of those things are carnivore I think having you know they always talk about plant-based or you know they would talk about plant slants and like as long as your plate is like primarily vegetables and you can then you can like have a little protein and you're good right but I think it's like well carnivore is the opposite right it's like push out the grains push out the sugar push out all of the plants because turns out plants are toxic and then like do predominantly, but to me, it's like 95% or you're not really going to get the benefits. That's my impression of, I consider someone who's eating 95% animal foods. I don't care what it is. You're a carnivore to me. That's my personal definition of it, but you're not going to get the full benefits until you go a hundred percent carnivore and a hundred percent animal foods and basically zero to no carbs. And then from there, you know, you can just keep going to, to optimize your carnivore. So that's my take. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I w- I'd like to just kind of compare that to the, uh, like if you're eating 95% all the time, it's very different than if you had something non-carnivore once in a while, like once a month or on your birthday, you have a piece of cake or something. That's very different than eating eating uh 95 or 90 percent or 85 percent or or dirty carnivore or whatever (laughs) so right so what do you think brooke put you put your two cents in you know i so it's fun um i mean i think it's this whole range basically i think it's an animal-based diet um but there's certainly been most of the time the past two and a half to close to three years I've just been eating beef and salt and water, but not all the time. There's been whole months that I'm doing all kinds of other uh, meat and I have chickens. So I eat eggs and and I use dairy. And I, so I think it's really an animal based diet because when you think of people living all over the world, um, there are certain climates that they're, you know, they're not going to even be running into many we've all heard this before, into many plants, but they still might incorporate some plants. And there's other climates where they're eating um, a lot of fish or a lot, you know, so there's a, there's a big range. So, but, so for me, it's, 
animal foods. I mean, there are people who talk about honey being carnivore because it is from bees. An animal food, kind of, so if you want to stretch animal. it. <laughs> and, and since carnivore isn't really, it's, it's a ketogenic diet, but it's not based on, it's not focused on staying ketogenic or, or, or being, you know, measuring your ketones necessarily, although people do that. And so since that's not the focus, you can be eating animal foods like liver, which have carbohydrates, scallops, which have carbohydrates, eggs, which have carbohydrates. So, so, so if it's not really about, it's not really about carbohydrates, although some people call it zero carb, but it's not really about carbohydrates. It's really more about animal foods, nutrient dense animal foods. And, it, and I, I think it's great that it's purposely left broad. And so people can kind of run with it and work within it. And, you know, they can be card carrying carnivore, carnivores, even if they're doing this or doing that. Um, and someone else is just eating, eating beef and no salt. So, I mean, th so there's a huge range and because it's really about getting to know your body, getting to know your health, getting to understand how nutrients work with for yourself and and taking responsibility for your own health and and you have plenty of room to work around and so i think when i you know when i hear someone say well i'm 95 percent carnivore i'm 90 percent carnivore you know five or ten percent leaves actually quite a bit of room for i don't know chocolate cake i guess i mean for anything for pineapple for you know, for all kinds of different things. And so, um, but it, but if someone is, is saying I'm 90% carnivore, I'd still call that a carnivore. So really there's a big range here, but it's basically animal-based diet that you see animal food as your food and all other things are medicine or um, ways to balance or ways to, socialize or something but your food is comes from animals ray what do you say yeah i can't agree more so uh definitely with brooke and janice um so now there is a big difference i, I definitely consider any anywhere in 90 percent range as carnivore uh i'm saying that though depending on your ailments and depending on what your objectives are the higher end of carnivore to 100% carnivore, and also your addictions. You know, let's say, hey, that extra five to 10% makes you go, you know, to 50%. Well, that's a problem. You need to know yourself best. And, uh, you know, I'm one of those that, hey, if I'm 95%, that won't last long. So I'll just kind of go down the power pole from there. Uh, so that's just not possible. So obviously, I'm forced to go 100%. But saying that, is there a big difference in health between 95% and 100%? Oh, man, unbelievable difference. Um, I would even say 98% to 100% is a huge difference. Now, say, again, as a standard, that would be like, for example, I'm 100% carnivore. I consider 100% carnivore. But will I have a birthday cake for my kids? Yes, I will. So does that make me what I consider, oh, that's not really 100%, that's 99 point whatever, whatever. No, I'm just going to say, hey, I'm 100% carnivore, you know. Um, so I will also eat dirty carnivore where there is, there is like sauces on my meats uh, and spices, you know, which is plant-based. So to be exact, you could get down to the percentage, but I'm going to say I'm 100% carnivore. I not only get huge benefits from 100% carnivore, but I feel like, you know, um, I feel like if you've never tried it and just stayed at 95% in a way, you're doing yourself a disfavor. Try it, see what it does for you. If you're a good moderator and you can stay at 95% the whole time, I know some people that can 90, 95% and not go back to the car hole then fine. And you're getting the healing you need and you feel like you're getting everything you can out of it. Okay. That's fine. Or you can even rotate in and out of it. I even told some people 
that as a 100% carnivore, you could do that as a uh, detox, just do 100% carnivore for a month or, uh, or reset, whatever you want to call it. Uh, do, do it every year or three months reset, whatever, just to get yourself kicked back. Now, if you fall in love with it and say, well, it's stupid for me to go in and out of it because, you know, it makes me, it makes me want, want more, um, then stick around with it. No harm done. I get uh, the, the main problem is socialization, just like uh, Brooke said. So that is something that we have to be careful for also. So some people don't want to stay 100% because of that. In my mind, though, socialization doesn't matter. They're not putting food in my mouth. I'm the one putting my own food in my mouth. So that's easy for, for me to say. So that's my two cents. What about you, Tom? We can't hear you, Tom. Tom, what do you think, Tom? Sorry. He's busy. I hit the mute button again. I <laughs> So yeah, no, at the end of the day, the, the, the best side to be on is the one that works. So, and sometimes I think it's kind of comical how people are arguing about exactly what the carnivore diet is because it, it is a meat-based or flesh-based diet. And people start arguing about what meat is. Does meat include fat? Well, to me, it does. And it's kind of like, you know, no, knowing if you got enough fat versus enough protein, let's say, is kind of a key at some point, but for the most part, most people do just start eating ribeyes or New York strips and they're fine. And we know, we know from, uh, you know, anecdotal evidence through conversation that most people do best on beef and lamb and goat and stuff like that. The, the herbivores, you know, and from a historical standpoint, we know we were walking around eating woolly mammoths and three toed sloths and mastodons and, woolly rhinos, you know, that was our, that was our food for, you know, a million years until they, they went away. And then we started eating more and more like cattle and deer and stuff like that, the leaner, smaller animals. But um, most people report that uh, they don't do so good if they eat a lot of chicken, like they're just not satisfied. They don't have the same sort of energy, but you know, there's nothing wrong with eating chicken if you're doing good with it. Uh, I know come across a couple of people that prefer pork. They do great on pork. They thrive on pork. That's fine. They're all meat. I personally, I love, I try and work in some shrimp every day. I get oysters all the time. I love eating oysters. I would eat more mussels and clams if they're a little easier to get, you know? So I look at it. I, I look, I'm the kind of guys reading articles about what was in the trash pits of our ancestors, you know? And clearly we, we typically live close to the water because we needed to. We ate a lot of food from the water, but we clearly ate lots and lots of food off land. And, and, and we know that even before there's any evidence we had fire, we followed the migrating herds of, of uh, um, mammoths into Northern Europe as the ice age was setting in. It seems suicidal, but, but we were robust enough and all we needed was a good food supply and something to make our clothing. We even made our homes out of their bones, right? So we made dwellings out of mammoth bones and stretched our skins over it and lived in it and went out and hunted them and ate them. And so for me, there was plenty of evidence. And I think that explains why most of us are happy eating ribeye or, or uh, you know, whatever. But any sort of meat feels good. And, and then, you know, you get people arguing whether uh, spices are allowed or not. And it's like, it really depends on whether you tolerate it or not. Cause there was a time when, like, I realized I had to stop putting pepper on my steak cause it was, it was causing issues. And then last time I went out for a ribeye with the uh, family and, uh, I was eating a steak at a place I'd never been to before. And they do heavily season their stuff. And I was like, mm, I wonder if this is going to be an issue. And it was no issue at all. And it was it was probably the most seasoned steak I've ever had in a restaurant, period. You know, it was like, wow, they really do it up here. And it, it didn't bother me. But if I like that every day, it probably would. So, you know, just because you want to season your steak or perhaps you put a little horseradish on your shrimp or, you know, whatever. I don't really think that's an issue. Maybe you squeeze some lemon juice on your fish. You know, I don't think it matters. You know, I don't think we're dependent on plants for our nutrients. I think 
plant nutrients are typically inferior, plant proteins are inferior. You know, of course we've rattled on about uh, phytic acid, oxalates and on and on lectins and all these things, which I think are inferior and downright toxic to some degree, but we can all tolerate them to some degree as well. So I think they're un typically unnecessary, not that they couldn't have some medicinal purpose, but I think what we see time and time again is when people go carnivore and they really buckle down their mood improves, their health improves, their energy levels improve. They start to resolve issues. They start not needing medications. So obviously their blood sugar stabilizes, their insulin stabilizes, you know, their depression recedes, their anxiety recedes. And so I'd say any diet you're on that achieves that is, is the right diet. Now, if you find cravings creeping back in, like, like Ray was saying, you need to, you might need to tighten things up, right? You might need to, you know, if you feel carb cravings coming in, you need to avoid things that are sweet or uh, smell like sweets or whatever, you know, you don't want those things triggering that. And so I, I think that, uh, you know, in a sort of way, uh, we kind of, you know, I like to be under the same tent with the other low carb, carb people. I think that most of us are just convinced that we don't need those plants and if you want to eat, if you could tolerate some of it and you eat it once in a while, more power to you, right? Nobody's actually going to take your carnivore card away. Although we should probably get some printed up because that would be fun. I want a card. Yeah, get some printed up. Well, and Tom, just in what you're saying, I'm thinking back to, because I was a vegetarian for almost a decade, right? And so I look at it just super simple, you know, that it's like, if you think you had a car that needed to run on diesel, and you've been putting in like regular gasoline the whole time, right? That you're running your your vehicle on the wrong fuel type altogether. That's how I look at it because I destroyed, you know, my mental and physical health thinking that I should be eating plants and a plant-based diet and that should be the primary fuel source because that's what I was told and I believed it and then it's the same thing as running a car that's meant and designed to run on a different fuel type. Mm. But when we talk about, you know, like you're saying, yeah, some people can tolerate plants and maybe it gives them a variety they like and they can put it on their plate around the edges and it's okay. But for some of us, you know, I look at it as like, oh, I, you know, I fill up my car with gasoline and then I'm going to throw some rocks in there right I'm just going to throw some rocks in and I think my car will be okay right it should be okay mm -hmm. um but I'm at the point where it's like I used to think and I get what you're saying it's like different things work for different people some people need more seafood some people need more fat you know there's a whole lot of room for for range of what people need right but for me like Raymond kind of talked about I mean I'm an abstainer in the sense that plants do not work with me and my biochemistry and my gut and maybe I'm going through a healing period where I just need to completely eliminate them it's not about being dogmatic for me I don't think oh if there was something later down the line that oh I find out you know that something I can tolerate then I might but again, to me, it's just the, the simple concept that it's like, well, you don't put rocks in your, in your gas tank because you don't want to fuck your car up. Oh, no, pardon you me. Got, you, <laughs> you, make a, you make a great point. You make a great point. And that's that's a wonderful analogy. You don't want to be putting diesel in a gas engine because it's a problem. It's a big problem, right? Well, yeah. And also just from a survival standpoint, like you talked about that we've evolved. If you think back, well, what were people eating? I mean, yeah, maybe seafood, maybe woolly mammoth. But sometimes if you look at it very simply, I think to myself, well, if you were really hungry and you had plate A had a ribeye on it and plate B had like a beautiful garden salad on it, right? right? And you knew you had to survive and you could only choose one, I'm pretty sure even the vegans would choose the steak, right? It's just because we live in a society of all of this abundance and you're able to get, you know, acai berries from the rainforest and just like, you know, there's just right. so much choice, right? There are all these like, right. you know, processed foods. I mean, there. it's like, that's the reason why we have this false sense of that, oh, you know, kind of anything goes, just do what works for you. But if it came down to survival, you can bet your bottom dollar that people would, everybody in their right mind would choose the plate with the steak on it because it's like nutrient 
dense, right? And it's gonna, it's, you know, instinctively that it's gonna sustain you because it has fat and protein. And um, my partner, Aaron, he had told me that when his dad, his dad, who's now, he just turned 80, literally like a month ago, he had told him that when he was younger and he was really poor, that he would spend his money and buy a steak, right? Because he knew, he was just like, well, what can I get? I only have this much money. I need something that's going to keep me going. And he would buy steaks, right? So it's like, I don't know. To me, that just puts it in really simple terms, right? It's choice A or choice B fuel type. Yes, well, we you do. Know what you mentioned yeah. when it comes down to it comes down to nutrients, and it actually does because if you're in the woods and you didn't have that plate of that beautiful salad or that plate of, of already prepared ribeye, and you're in the woods or you're in a in any country setting, and you have to survive, you're not going to be able to do it on just gathering some some plants you won't last very long anyway i mean you will have to eat some kind of animal and whether that be that you know you could hunt a rodent or hunt a deer or whatever you're going to hunt but you're going to have to eat some animals and so we we know that for nutrients for nutrient density um, and for just nutrients, all the nutrients we need, it's got to come from animal and animal fat. I mean, there's other things. There's other things. I mean, I think that mankind has, has fig, humankind has figured out in the plant world. I mean, we get incredible amounts of medicines from plants and herbs and aromatics and embellishments and maybe things that sustain us over a long winter or a, a, a hot summer. And so we can incorporate these other things, but but we, but we just can't live on them. Yet, yet because of this wonderful abundance that you mentioned, that we can import and, and everything's beautiful in the store, we think that maybe we could live on them. And, and vegans say that they live on them, but they're living usually on concentrated nuts and seeds and, and ground, which, would take a huge amount of energy to, 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 to gather and, and, um, and live off of that. And so if you really just break it down to the having to sustain yourself, you wouldn't be able to live on it very well. Not, and that's not even mentioning all the kinds of medical situations that the three of us and so many of our peers have sort of sorted through with plants, with different plants. So even if there was, even if, we, so I think that even if we can survive on, on a plant-based diet, and God knows I did survive for many years, eating plenty of brown rice, virtuous brown rice, mm. we're not really thriving. You know, we're not really thriving. So, I mean, that's the, and I think maybe we've come to this place that we want to do more than survive. We really want to thrive. I mean, time is is ticking, and we want to we want to get the best. We want to give the best to ourselves. For so sure. I kind of think the carnivore diet is trying to give yourself the best, the best nutrients. Yes, one hundred percent. I think the big, the big hump is getting over that idea that you're supposed to eat all these plants and healthy grains and fruits and yeah. vegetables, and it's we don't realize you know, in our time and place, we don't realize how ridiculous that is. I mean, an 80 year old guy probably remembers a time when it's like, but the people who thrived ate meat. We all wished we could afford more meat. That was the point, you know? Yeah. And uh, that's all been forgotten and replaced with this ideology that, you know, killing animals lowers your vibration and, you know, it's violence and we should, uh, we should, uh, you know, we're destroying the planet by eating the animals. But I mean, that's how nature works. Animals tend to specialize in certain certain food sources, you know, especially plant-based animals. They, I mean, some only eat one kind of plant, period, right? And even, you know, the bigger animals, they tend to specialize in certain types of, of food, you know? So think of that where this omnivorous machine that's supposed to walk around mostly eating plants is kind of ridiculous, especially since the plants we eat now mostly didn't exist more than a few hundred years ago, right? You couldn't just go around and scrounge potatoes and nuts and seeds everywhere. That's a ridiculous idea, you know? So, and you certainly don't find that in the trash pits of our ancestors, you know? There's all these sites that have been habituated for 
thousands of years on and off and they left the debris behind of what they ate. And then you start digging into their fossils and you find out that, oh, look, there's still collagen in here for 40,000 years. And we know for a fact that we were apex predators who ate predators. So as much as we don't put wolves on the menu these days, we used to eat them too. Wow. So. Well, and I just think back to being a kid, right? I mean, when you're a kid, you're a little bit more instinctive. And I remember that we would have a barbecue, like during the warm months, we would have a barbecue every Sunday, right? Yeah. And we would have, we would have every time we would have burgers, hot dogs, and then yeah. chicken, I think we had chicken wings and chicken thighs. And I would be so excited, like just watching my dad out barbecuing, right? And just like fiending for the meat, right? Just so excited that there was, that was sort of the one time where we had this abundance, right? There were multiple choices. There was, there was all meat instead of the, normally, um, you know, my mom grew up and her parents were immigrants. And so meat, like you said, was the first thing when you didn't have money and you get to this country, it's like, you want meat because that's considered luxury and health and thriving. So my grandpa was obsessed with lamb chops. Like every time I went to his house, he was making, you know, a huge tray of lamb chops. Right. And I, and I remember liking it. Cause I was like, Oh, it's so fatty and delicious. Like I've always really liked fat. My mom would make uh, oxtail stew and oxtail soup. And then um, I always just remember thinking I loved gristle and I love fat and I love beef. And, um, my mom, I mean, my parents were kind of, you know, frugal, right? And so they would get one steak for the whole family, right? And I remember my mom slicing it like paper thin and it was probably some lean cut, right? I had never tried a ribeye or a New York steak until I was like 40, right? And so it was always this really lean, like kind of sirloin, like pretty thin, right? A thin cut. And I, she would give me like a few paper thin slices and I would just be like, like staring at it like I just wanted more you know and I, I just think back to it's like you're in you instinctively know that that is like so nourishing so satisfying and so grounding and I always I just posted a, a, about how Bruce Lee it said he ate beef liver um and steak and that his favorite food was like um, you know like Chinese people eat um beef with oyster sauce and I kid you not that was like my favorite thing growing up like beef with, I mean, so delicious. Obviously now I don't eat the oyster sauce, but it was oyster sauce, probably with a bunch of additives, but you know, there's something oystery in there, right? <laughs> so anyway, I just, I think, again, it's like we overcomplicate things because there is so much choice. And it's like, you know, at the end of the day, if you think back to the times when you really were either growing because you're a kid and you're like, you know, you need some kind of protein and building blocks or in some fat, or, you know, when you've just been low and you get more in tune with that survival feeling, what are you going to crave? Usually beef, I would think, or maybe chicken or whatever. But fish, you know, fish is not very, it's not very satisfying to me. Like I am definitely a fatty beef eater, right? So I don't I mean, know. That's, do that. that's good. I'm yeah, like, yeah, I'm that's like, good. <laughs> well, you know, and I, I, also, we hobble ourselves you know, we, we kind of hobble or cobble ourselves, at least in this country, there was this whole movement diet for a small planet where everybody, you know, it was about virtue where everybody thought, you know, meat is really bad. You know, that brings your energy, you know, the energy is spiritual energy. You should eat, you should eat um, beans and grains, you know, complement your proteins and get this full protein. This was like a huge push. And so even though we always had this incredible abundance. In fact, I when I grew up, there was always meat on the table. There was meat, there was milk, there was vegetables, there were maybe potatoes, but there was always meat. I mean, that really, when I hear people talk about the SAD diet, the standard American diet, the standard American diet really used to be meat at the table all the time and maybe right. potatoes and some vegetables and some ice cream or cake or something. And when I think about it now, that's not that bad. What's much worse is like all salads and beans and salads and beans and beans and salads and salads and beans. And so if this virtue thing that came on, instead of like thinking of our bodies as this temple that we need to strengthen and to, you know, be like the animal, the human power animal that we are, you know, because a tiger isn't going to be thinking about the virtue and maybe they should eat lentils instead of that zebra. And, and really we are, we are just as deserving. We are just as deserving to eat 
what we know it um, provides all the nutrients that we have. So, but I, you know, I was part of that whole, you know, I thought, oh, okay, I guess, I guess, you know, brown rice and vegetables are good. So more brown rice and vegetables are even gooder. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even more virtuous. Exactly. And I got really thrown for a loop with when I was a vegetarian. Um, I read the China study, right? By yeah. Colin, uh, T. Colin Campbell. Campbell. I think. Yeah. And I was so thrown I did a for video a loop. On that. Oh, you did? Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. just imagine I'm Chinese, so I'm thinking these are my people. This is my genetic, you know, lineage. I better do this. So I just doubled down after that. I was just like, I've got to like, you know, I, I tried pushing toward vegan at that point. Cause I was thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to die if I have any protein you know, any animal protein rather. And it's just like, what a crock, you know? I mean, it turned out to be. I, know, I, the I like to ask this question. Uh, you know, do you know anybody who's never had a cavity? Yes. Every once in a while I talk to somebody who's never had a cavity, but it's rare, right? It's rare. I have yeah. so many, I've had so many, but, and, but I do know, I do know people who, right. who never had Cavity. But I mean, it's common now for little kids to get cavities, right? A few people make it to adulthood without it. And I think right there, that's the canary in the coal mine, you know, and I think, you know, anybody who's read the Weston A. Price uh, um, work that, you know, these diets rich in carbohydrates would have killed us off. We would have never made it if we were eating grain and figs and grapes and, and all that stuff, because all that sugar you know, causes the streptococcus to prolifer proliferate in our mouths and it eats the it eats holes in the enamel of our teeth. So yeah, I mean I would have to I would have to go a step further and, and say that di that diets that were missing plenty of meat and animal fats that were missing animal fats fell along that way because there have been diets that that have incorporated other things, but they were rich in like the old, like farmer on the farm, diets of people on the farm, and they, they ate plenty of meat and potatoes, but they ate milk and maybe whole milk and, un, you know, unpasteurized milk right. and fat, butter and meat and lard. And, and so I, I think it's really about the inclusion instead of, you know, plant oils, instead of seed oils, instead of nuts and well, seeds. Well, you know, and I think we kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, we, we talk about these diets that included a lot of variety when we were eating plant foods. And I think that the, that's the only way to even survive short term on a plant based diet is to have a huge variety. And that's because the nutrients in plants are not dense. And in most cases, they're in inferior forms of the, of the nutrients. A lot of the nutrients are tied up in in the fiber and they're neutralized by phytic acid and they're just inferior to begin with. So like if you even look at these vegan or vegetarian bodybuilders, they're consuming these massive amounts of blended proteins from plants. Not a plant, not just peas or soy or whatever, but massive quantities of blended proteins. And that's the only way you can even get close to simulating what you get from red meat. They have a whole lab. They have a whole lab working for them. You know, right. they have all these laboratory foods. And that's why the, I think that's the real tragedy or shame of, of sending out this message to worldwide that vegan diets work because people in third worlds or people in, you know, that do not have access to laboratory supplements, it's gonna work horrible for them. It's right. really terrible for their children and terrible for them. And so I think it's really a, a disservice. I do and I just, I mean, I think, yeah, you've got all these studies and all this science about all the nutrition and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I've read a ton of, I was just actually writing a list of all of the nutrition books that I have studied over the years between going from vegetarian, you know, I did anti-candida. I read the whole wheat belly theory about, you know, I got wheat and gluten and grains out of there and then dr lustig who talks about sh sugar the bitter truth i took everything like it's not for lack of i tried all of these other ways of optimizing and like you know trying to get behind the logic of all of it the blood type diet everything but at the end of the day my lived experience is that i was a miserable 
hangry vegetarian, right? Depressed and anxious. And I was literally hungry 24 seven because no matter how many foods you combine and no matter how much bulk you eat, you're still ravenous. And looking back, all of the kind of junk foods that I would crave like pizza, potato chips, uh, tortilla chips, what was my body craving? Fat, right? Of course I'm craving fat and then I'm getting the wrong kind because I'm getting like, you know, vegetable fats, which is super horrible for you, right? right? But I can look back and, you know, I'd want French fries. Like I was just fiending for fat, not only protein, but also fat. And the proof is just that when I was vegetarian and I finally, I remember the day that I ate my first meat again, right? I added, I ate chicken thighs. And literally, I've shared with you before that I literally turned on, like my whole body just like booted, like I'd been sitting in the closet for, you know, 10 years and all of a sudden it was like, everything came back on. I felt like my body reactivated. I wasn't freezing cold. My brain suddenly turned on. And then, you know, the next day I I went out and ate some red meat, some beef, right? Two servings of it. Because my body was like, hell yeah, give it to me, give it to me. But to me, that's just like, that is as simple as it gets because you know how you feel and then from one day of you know within hours when my body processed that first bit of 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 carnivore food i was like oh my god i've been basically dead for for like a decade you know yes can i ask you when you left meat because you you shared with us your childhood where there was meat and it was kind of a, rejo- a rejoiced meal you know oh. rejoicing in that meal when you left that meat did you leave those childhood meals because you had read and had heard that that meat was you know was was not as virtuous or would bring your energy down or wasn't healthy. Oh, all of that <laughs> stuff, right? All of that. But I started because I met some guy on match.com when I was like 28 and he was a vegetarian. So he told me all the virtues of vegetarianism. And then I just started from there. And then because I was so heavily into yoga and just reading all these books about nonviolence and living in Santa Cruz, I mean, you know, like if you don't get a lot of peer pressure to be like, if you're a vegetarian, you're not considered like holy enough. You got to be a freaking full on vegan, right? Like we talked about cafe gratitude. You need to be like eating a cafe gratitude once a week. You need to be a full on vegan and you need to be like real thin and doing a lot of yoga to even be, and a lot of meditation. It's a whole package deal, right? (laughs) But I just, you know, yeah, I mean, that was it. I just, I just, went there and then because my health declines were so it's not like I was coming from this great diet before I mean I was eating a standard American diet so then when I went into vegetarian it was just this like you know complete deterioration like slow decline and you know and your body's more forgiving right because I started in my late 20s and then early 30s I was okay I mean I had a lot of problems I was really cool but I never really connected it to diet right until all of a sudden I'm like, you know, in a huge pit of problems, <laughs> you know. I think that people could be vegetarians or vegans because their childhood diet actually had meat. Their childhood diet actually right. was a little more solid. Because every, you know, those, you know, when they say standard, when they say the sad diet or standard American diet, you know, I sort of think, well, you know, that's not as bad right. as, as these contemporary vegetarian oh, yeah. because you're eating you're eating meat at every meat at every dinner. There's you would be food. way better off eating bologna and hot dogs than you would be eating a bowl of cereal for sure. Yeah. Even with raisins, you're a home meal with meat and eat meat and potatoes. Yeah, meat so potatoes. true. I, I don't know if you guys saw it, but uh, there was a comment on the video I did about Michelle Lowe saying that she wanted. Tristan Haggard, she wanted to kill him, you know. <laughs> and some vegan came in. They're like, "Oh yeah, you, you carnivores, you just pay somebody else to murder animals for you, or something like that." And I'm thinking, well, how do, how, where do you think your food comes from? You're just paying people to murder animals so that you can steal the animals' food, you know. You're, you're buying berries flown in from some jungle somewhere because you think that's going to keep you alive, and all this row cropping is destroying the topsoil and killing the planet. You're, you're killing everything from microorganisms all the way up to wild pigs or coyotes or whatever you got to bears even to get keep your crops going so you can eat granola and fake hamburger patties and and artificial chicken nuggets and 
<laughs> you know, all this craziness, you know? Well, and then the factories are probably producing a fair amount of pollution that are processing all those weird, you know, protein powders and weird fake meats and all of that well, stuff. Well, all that fertilizer is sucked out of the air. So the liquid nitrogen is sucked out of the air with a, by the Haber process, which is requires gin ginormous factories to suck in the air and cool it down and, and get the right pressure so you get liquid nitrogen. And that's what they take. They That's where the 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 nitrogen fertilizer comes from for all these crops, right? So right there, you have to, you have this energy consuming process and then you have to transport that fertilizer around and put it on the crops. And then you need pesticides, you need herbicides, you need fungicides, you have to, extra, and I live in a farming area. You guys probably don't live too far from me either, but like when they, when they take down the corn, the seagulls fly 20 miles inland to eat all the, the dead uh, mice and squirrels and, mm. and stuff like that. The hawks are circling around. So if you have any doubt <laughs> that, that, that animals aren't murdered for corn, wheat, barley, oats, you know, whatever, just forget about it. Vegetables. Yeah, vegetables. All the vegetables. Cabbage, same thing, yeah. And you'll see full grown wild animals stuck in corn combines, like wild boar and coyotes. Sure, they could run away if they knew which way to run. But, you know, when you get stuck in a wheat field or a corn field and you're not really sure what's going on, the machine just comes along and kills you just the same. Well, even if you grow your own little garden plot, you know, you've got to trap gophers up here. You know, I live in the country. You have to trap gophers. You have to poison snails. You have to, like, do some kind of tricky thing with, with a plant combining so the insects don't devour all of your plants. You have to fence it up so the deer doesn't come over and jump over and eat the plants. You're const it's a constant battle against all the other animals that want to eat that food. Or, or you could just have one cow one year for a whole year. Yeah, and I, speaking of that one cow for one whole year, I was watching these um, fancy butchers uh, cut up a half a cow on a YouTube video and they were just like, you know, cutting it up and all of the different cuts. They were telling you this is the this, this is the that. And they literally used every piece, right? It was like they were expertly cutting this up into all of the different. And I thought, my gosh, like, like you said, that's feeding you for an entire year. This cow, you can use literally everything in it, you know, zero waste. So, and that yeah, cow we could have been eating grass. That's we just pat just been on pasture the whole time. I mean, some some cows don't, but you could if you wanted to pick up pick one that's just on pasture with the we, rain. I mean, we were talking like about Jello before we started recording. And, you know, I, I saw this picture, some vegan had posted it. It was a bunch of cow legs in a barrel, you know, at the slaughterhouse. And they're like, yeah, this is this is what's left over from your food. And I'm like, that's not going to be left over because I buy marrow bones. Who hasn't bought gel gelatin? That's where that comes from. You know, that doesn't go to waste, you know, and then yeah, a lot of them. I don't think anything is left over. I think, I think it's used. Uh, everything is used. The bones, everything. Sure. And certainly the tail, sure. <laughs> the delicious tail. tail. Yeah. I do. I do like to tease the people that say they eat nose to tail. Like I'll even, I even pulled this on Austin last time. I was like, so which animal has the best tasting nose? <laughs> she said, you know. Patrick, I haven't actually had a nose. I'd like some snout soup, please. Maybe elephant. I guarantee elephant. you my people, the Chinese eat every part of every my yeah. uncle we were i'm from a fishing family so we would invite my uncle over and you know eat like a large mouth bass right steamed kind of chinese style large right mouth bass oh yeah we had a lot of fish growing up right and uh -huh. and so I he would but he would eat fish. he would literally eat he would roll the, the eyeball has a little white thing that'll come out so he would roll it around on his plate and then pop it in his mouth just to creep me out <laughs> he would eat the eyeball but i remember even as a kid the other thing i did was you know, we would sometimes kind of like pan fry the fish and I would eat the crispy, I would eat the tail and the fins because yeah. they would get yeah. crispy. And, sure. you know, it's like you just have these instincts as a kid, you know, I remember gnawing on like gnawing on my little, you know, my chicken to eat the little gristly caps off of the drumsticks oh, and everything. Yeah. There's so. a Japanese stew called koi, koi koku, I think it is. And it's a whole carp. 
And so the carp, so it's a whole big carp that's cooked down for hours with burdock, shaved burdock, which is, it's like, so it's a really strengthening dish, you know, springtime strengthening dish for people because burdock is strong. It, it burrows down deep into the soil root and they use this whole carp and they eat the whole thing and the bones are dissolved and it's a delicious, a delicious thing. So pe in other words, humans have been eating animals, all the animals since, since the beginning of time. Well, we have physical evidence for 3.7 million years, which technically predates actual humans. So we're talking pre-humans. We're making tools to butcher animals and leaving marks on the bones as they cut away the flesh, right? So that's how long we know it's been going on at least that long. That's a long time, much longer than we've been growing wheat, barley, corn, oats, and all the other stuff, you know? So. I guess that's the Egyptian time. We had, there were grain and, and there are lots of problems with their health. C certainly the Sumerians and the, uh, the uh, Egyptians were growing crops. And, you know, that's going back like maybe 3,000 years or so, maybe 4,000. The first evidence, I think, of cultivating any sort of grains is in the Levant, which is kind of in the Middle East there. And that's where wheat originally came from. And you know, if you've read the book Homo sapiens, it's kind of like wheat domesticated us, right? It's like we get that dopaminergic effect from the from the uh, the wheat that kind of uh, makes us want to eat more of it, you know. And so we manage to cultivate it. And arguably, eating grain is better than starving. So in some cases, people may needed it, but. It, a lot of cases, it was probably just a treat. It's probably a lot of work to cultivate. It was very difficult. And in a lot of cases, it might very well have been our food's food. You know, that's the other thing you could, when you look at all these vegetables, you know, kale was a crop that was meant to go to livestock and it, the livestock didn't, it didn't take to it. So they're like, well, let's feed it to people. So. Uh, next time you're at the store and you're looking at that kale. I, I don't blame the livestock for not taking to it. Really? We actually, Aaron always says, uh, my Aaron, he always says, kale no. <laughs> like, hell no. It's because kale is just like, oh, no. you can actually feel the kale like ripping your guts as it, you know, as it goes through your digestive tract. <laughs> yeah. So much kale. I used to eat kale too. Kale. The brown <laughs> rice. Yeah, the basmati rice. I still have burlap sacks that the the basmati rice used to come in. Yeah. I keep them around as a joke. I use them in props and videos sometimes. <laughs> I believe all that stuff was good for us. Brown rice is better than white rice. And now if I yeah, had to eat rice, especially I would if eat you wanted rice. slaves. Especially if you wanted armies, if you wanted slaves, if you wanted to keep people around, you had to feed masses right. of people. Well, then grain was perfect for that. Right. Right. And I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Don't worry. I mean, I think that when you had masses of people and you wanted to sort of keep them around, you would, you would, I mean, grain was perfect. People didn't have to go out and hunt and you could serve the masses of people. Plus you, you could, you could add some meat to that and, and, and you can survive. You could probably do okay. You could probably do okay. On but it's just grain. subsistence, you know? I mean, right. they literally were just trying to keep them from dying, right? Well, when they're in their prime. Well, I think that you could probably do okay. I mean, I think what's in trouble is when you got into industrial seed oils. Right. But well, I, yeah, I, it, it, oh, it's probably, it might have something to do with how much of their diet it made up, right? I and mean, they probably didn't eat that much grain, really. Yeah, and I, I think it's an unpopular thing to say, but I really do believe that carnivores are smarter <laughs> than the vegans and vegetarians in terms of their ability to function because you know your brain needs the, the I mean I'm, I'm learning I feel like the brain needs like animal fat you know not just protein I mean I that's astounding to me the degree of functioning of my brain since I've added beef fat not just eating, you know, you know, leaner ground beef or whatever, but eating this fatty ribeye, right. I feel so much smarter than I did as a vegetarian. Right. Well, and <laughs> if we're being honest, the brain needs multiple fuels, you know, both or multiple right. materials. Some of it's fuel and some of it's for rebuilding it because your brain is somewhere around 60% fat. You know, it's, it's fat in the aqueous environment, which, you know, in, in a way it makes sense because you need the the different materials 
working together in order to have regulated processes, right? But w I think I think the 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 plant based or the heavy plant based diet is is multifactorial in its problems because one excessive carbohydrates raises blood sugar and the glucose does damage, but it also raises your insulin levels and the excess insulin does damage. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with, with uh, mood disorders and, and dysfunctions. But like you said, the brain needs a certain amount of fat, needs omega-3 fatty acids and so forth to, to be healthy and regenerative. And then on top of that, we have all the issues of, like we said, the plant material blocks the absorption of all kinds of micronutrients that we need. And when you eat meat, all those things are present in the proper ratios and you're not consuming stuff that blocks it, you know, so you can yeah. then absorb you need protein. It. You need right. zinc, you need, you need, yeah, you need these nutrients. So even if you are going to eat other things as well, you still need these nutrients and plants cannot provide these nutrients and no yeah. amount of grain can provide these nutrients that, that animals and animal foods provide. Yeah, you need carnosine and carnitine. So it's a little scary going, looking into the future about the direction that they want to take this virtuous plant a diet into this kind of kibble or fake meats because I think, or like a mixture of fake meats because I think that this is really where it's being pushed. So more and more just meat will be replaced by these fake things and and meat might become instead of the the least processed food that it is now in the grocery store, it might become just so rare to find this simple food for the masses. True. And that's what's really disturbing. Ironically, we might be better off eating soylent green than fake meat. <laughs> so at least it was made out of people, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> I never even <laughs> ate, when I was a vegetarian, I didn't eat the fake meat. I mean, because it didn't make any sense to me. It's like, why do I want to eat something that's like simulating me? It sounds disgusting, and it and it is, right? <laughs> but, well, or I guess what I mean is the kibble, because because vegetarian, you know, pe vegetarians eat the kibble. They eat like protein powders, right. and they eat protein, you know, some kind of you know sausage, you know, you know, meat sausage that isn't meat or whatever. But it, it's sort of like thinking, you know, they're eating it because they're thinking that it's 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 got that name. It's got meat, sort of like nut milk, sort of like oat milk. It must kind of be the same as milk because it says milk on it. It's in a carton, it says oat milk. And so, you know, people people are, get fooled, hoodwinked, like we all did. Um, people get fooled. Sad. Funny that you mentioned Kibblebrook because today um, our neighbor at the Santa Cruz Harbor in the boat, a few boats down, was so interesting because they said, hey, hey, um, this dog, she has this dog that was really having health problems, um, maybe probably having issues with the kibble. And so they had heard us talking a lot about carnivore. And for whatever reason, the lady decides to start feeding the dog meat, right? To switch it over to carnivore. Yeah. But, but get this, it wasn't just meat. She started feeding the dog ribeye. <laughs> and so the dog, the yeah. first ribeye, the dog ended up eating an entire ribeye, right? Yeah. And so, so <laughs> they're like, they're like, we have to tell you, we have to tell you, the dog is like super, like healthy again, and they're like, the dog has muscles, and this dog is fierce, and the dog is just like completely happy. transformed, right, and happy and totally healthy now, right? And so we were like, great. So they sent a picture of the dog and it's like, oh yeah, the dog looks good, but what's the before picture, right? And they're like, all these issues resolved with the dog, right? And the funniest part is that the lady has not tried carnivore herself. It's like, you're feeding your dog. <laughs> well, I think of Jordan Peterson's rule number two. I think he talks about like, take, you know, treat yourself like you would someone you're taking care of. So people have trouble mentally it's like they'll take great care of their dog they'll take great care of you know their family member and get them to take their medication and do all these things but they won't do it for themselves so i was just shocked that the, this lady's feeding the dog ribeye oh i mean it's so expensive to feed the dog ribeye when you're not eating it yourself right so that that to me was like 
we're going to still pose the question like, hey, so your dog's doing this great. You think you're worthy of <laughs> trying yeah, carnivore? Question. Yeah. But well, it's the, a block, the right? The is probably cheaper than the vet visits. Exactly. And I and I I should I should take that back because to me it's like I'm eating only the ribeye, eleven dollars a pound for prime ribeye, super marbled. I have to eat hardly anything. So it's like probably less than ten dollars a day. So you're right, yeah. the vet bill would cost you like thousands of dollars. You could buy, you know, two hundred yeah. ribeyes for the cost of the, the doctor or the vet visit, right? But it's the same for people, right? You have to pay for all of your prescriptions and your doctor's visits and your poor health and like long-term care. Like just buy the ribeye, you know? Maybe that dog will really, will somehow bring her into taking care of her own health as well. She takes I this hope so. Care. What does she eat? I don't know. I don't really know this lady that, that well, but... <laughs> but she lives a few boats down and so our, we're good friends with the neighbor and so she's like hey hey I gotta tell you guys right and they were both so excited about this dog's carnivore transformation <laughs> so I know I'm how that big, dog I'm a big dog lover and uh Ew. I yeah. would go to a lot of trouble to find the right dog food for my dogs and they just kept getting sicker and sicker you know and then now I've still got one. She's too shy to come on camera, but she's been a carnivore for, you know, three, four years now. And she's, when I got her, she was already a young adult. And I got her in probably like 2008 or something like that. So she's not a young dog, but she is extremely spry and doesn't have any health problems right now whatsoever. She's had nothing but meat for years. And I, I take, I buy liver, cow liver slice it up, throw it in the dehydrator. And she gets, you know, dehydrated liver every day as a snack. That's, oh, that's a treat she gets. And that is her favorite treat of all treats. So well, I know Bella that. fed her dog the, 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 some liver. And then Coach Ashley, do you know Coach Ashley? Her dog Lloyd is a carnivore mm -hmm. and he looks so happy and healthy. He, have well, you I'm seen him? Ask you, do you feed him? Do you feed your dog hamburger? Is that what you feed? I used to, but you know, I think she got wise. She's like, "Why are you feeding me the cheap cuts? And you're eating all the good stuff." <laughs> so Sorry, I'd feed? be, I'd feed her, and then she's looking at me. I'm cooking my steak, and she's like, "Hey, big guy, how about some steak down here?" <laughs> That's true love if you give her the steak, you know. Yeah, she eats nothing but steak. So oh, soon she really get rib ribeye, but she gets steak and uh, liver and. You know, she, we basically eat the same thing, my dog and I. She, I, I will buy a little bit cheaper cuts for her, you know, but she basically eats steak every day, twice a day, plus, you know, the liver. And she gets a little bit of oyster and shrimp here and there. And, oh. you know, just and if I'm eating, if I happen to be snacking on some turkey lunch meat or a hot dog or something, she gets that to her hamburger or whatever. Yeah. Wow. So cute. Wow, well, you should do a whole nother epidose on dogs, carnivore dogs. carnivore canines, right? That's yeah. the perfect name, carnivore canines. <laughs> I have I have brought it up in the past because you know it's like my my neighbors and I we would talk about like our research we did on dog food, you know, and our dogs, you know, like you're taking them to the vet. I, I I and when my mom passed away, I inherited her poodle too, and and between her, her that dog and my my older dog is gone now. I think I had six or seven scripts I had to hand out every day for these oh. dogs. And the poodle was on the special prescription dog food, canned dog food. And, and when my mom first died, like I didn't have a prescription and I was trying to get it and I would go to the store and I'm like, well, you got a prescription for that. And I'm like, well, my mom just died. I got her dog. I got to feed him. And I, it's the vet's not open. And some poor lady was like, well, I've got a script on it. You let him, let me buy it for him, you know, so that, you know, you can get by. Wait, 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 wait. Why, why do they have to have a prescription for the dog food? Let me go back uh, because it's a special kind of dog food. It's medicated. Oh. Food. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you the, the, the nexus of this problem is they get plaque on their teeth. And one of the videos I saw with this veterinarian is like, yeah, you're supposed to, you know, they, they sell like milk bones it's supposed to help clean the dog's teeth. It's like, number one, if they eat what dogs are supposed to eat, which is meat, they don't get plaque on their teeth. And number two, giving them milk bones 
bone to scrape the plaque off is like you scraping plaque off your te teeth with a cracker. It just doesn't really work. <laughs> you just get more, more plaque. And then what happens is they get the bacteria living in that plaque eventually gets to the heart valve and then they get heart problems. It just like humans. Just like, like us. That. Yeah, we get heart problems from, from bad, bad yes. dental hygiene, right? Which is mostly caused by our diet. And uh, then you got them on these medications because they got a heart murmur or whatever, and then the heart starts getting alert, large. And you know, my my dad, my dog had had uh, ultrasounds and everything of his heart to see what was going on. And yeah, he spent like I don't know, it was like five hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars just to go. Yeah, yeah, he's got heart problems. I keep him on the medication. <laughs> and just to have him die, you know. And dogs also suffer from anxiety and depression. It's so oh, yeah. obvious yeah. that, you know, it's yeah, like it's dietary so induced, you know, yeah, neurotic dogs. There's so many neurotic pets right now. Well, Ashley, I asked Ashley about that and her dog Lloyd is so, because I think he had maybe some trauma, you know, and so now he's just stabilized, right? Because he's on a nice hearty beef diet. <laughs> <laughs> I think she feeds him. Oh, oh, sweet. Beautiful. Yeah, so this dog is so cute. I've had this dog for uh, 13 Aww. years, probably. Wow. She, she was a street dog. She, her face is all covered with little scars from fighting other dogs. Poor baby. She was a feisty, well, it's a rat terrier, so it's a very feisty breed. Actually, that's where the, the rat terriers are bred from a type of dog called a feist. So that's where that term feisty comes from. No way. So they're they're pretty scrappy dogs, but um, they're they're excellent companions and hunting dogs. So, but she's adorable. She's uh, she's very very hardy, you know, and she's just been she's she looks been lucky great. To have me. Yeah. Oh, so she's thirteen or or older than that. I've had her for thirteen years, and she was an adult when I got her. Oh wow, she looks fantastic. But uh, rat terriers are pretty. They're pretty. They're usually long lived, anyways. So she's kicking aging to the curb, as they say on me. So. Yeah. <laughs> what a cutie. So you, could, so you could just give her. You could just feed her hamburger, though. You could just have I your think, dog. I think buy there's something burger. weird about hamburger that I've noticed. So. Like I tried to just eat hamburger like Brett, you know, our buddy Brett, he's just yeah. hamburger and bacon all the time. And I, after a while, like I tried different fat ratios. It's like, eh, I, I'd buy fresh ground ch chuck all the time. And I didn't, didn't do as well on it. The weird thing is if I buy the frozen Angus patties, I have a different experience when I eat those. And I like better. I don't, yes, a better experience. And I don't know if it's because the fat melts out of the other hamburger too easily and you lose it or something's going on when you cook it. And I tend to cook things on the rare side. And I, I know it's not safe, but I've eaten plenty of raw hamburger, you know, from the supermarket many, many times. And that's better than it cooked. But most of the time I'm going to cook it just because you can't walk around with or I take my lunch with me or my dinners with me to work and stuff like that. I don't like walking around with raw meat. A solid steak is entirely different than, than hamburger. And you always run that risk of when they grind the hamburger that they're mixing in contaminants, you know, particularly bacteria, especially from chicken or fish or something, you're going to get sick, right? So I think with Brett, because he eats the bacon too, he always has plenty of extra fat. Yeah. It's yeah, crispy bacon, though. It. <laughs> it's What's crispy that? bacon, and I'm like, how are you getting enough fat? Because yeah. he cooks it super crisp, right? Well, and bacon has less fat in it than we think. You can actually get more fat out of, like, a hot dog than you can out of bacon. You know, was, Lisa was the one who pointed that out to me. Oh, by the way, I forgot to invite her. Sorry, Lisa. <laughs> I think I, I was going to invite Jen, too, and I forgot Jen. But, uh, yeah, so bacon isn't necessarily as rich in fat as we would like it to be, and you lose a lot in the pan. Because, because if you cook it really crispy, you mean? Uh, yeah, and I don't. I, I like my bacon sauce. I like it like pastrami. That's how I like it. Yeah, so and it freaked my friends out until they tried it and they could stop eating it, you know. But yeah, yeah. cooking it crispy is a waste. Well, I also had the same I experience with ground beef that you did. I just, it just, at the beginning of carnivore, I was all about bacon, ground beef, eggs, just like hitting those hard, you know? And then over time, it's like, 
the ground beef just doesn't do it for me. Even if I eat it like almost raw, right? To try to keep more of the fat, like you were saying, I just, I don't feel as good. I don't get as much energy. It's, there's just something different about, and, and I, it's funny cause I'm doing this ribeye only thing, you know, I'm on 60 something days, right? And I think people see it as, you know, cause I'm on different platforms and they see it kind of as extravagant, right? And I'm just like, it's not, if that's the only thing you're buying, you know, right? I mean, it's like literally a big roast. That's like $200. Yeah. Especially you if know? you buy it that way, if you just buy yeah. the big thing yourself, it's, it's, but it's, great it's enough for, for, you know, for Aaron and I for an entire week. Right. And I also give some of it, you know, to my mom or whatever. And she makes some for my dad. And it's like, that thing is a huge amount of nutrient density in that log of, of ribeye. And I'm not buying anything else. Yeah, a lot so of people like, spend, okay, spend hundred dollars a week on on uh, on going out for coffee. You know, we're just going out to eat like a couple right. times for some crappy uh, meal. You know, right. and, and I, I rotate. Sometimes I eat hamburger, and then other times I'll be I'll get tired of that, and I'll just I'll do ribeyes, and then maybe I'll switch over to New York strips because I have extra fat piling up with my ribeye primal cuts, and then I'll switch back to ham. You know, and then I'll do oxtail or cheeks. I mean, I really kind of rotate around. And, and when I'm doing it, it's usually I really love whatever I'm eating now. It's like, oh, man, I'm all about these ribeyes. Right. I'll be eating oxtail. Like, oh, my God, it's my favorite. And then I'll be eating hamburger. And I'll think, oh, this is great. I'm so glad to be back to hamburger. So it's just almost like whatever is on that, in all that cast iron pan, I'm liking. If it's beef. Right. If it's beef. I mean, I eat lamb. I like that two little lamb chops. But really, it's beef. I think beef, I mean, I've been thinking about it more and more lately since my ribeye thing. And I'm just like, I really, I get carnivore is whatever, right? As long as it's animal based and you stick to a very high percentage of it, as we've talked about. But I've been following the people who I see getting the best results. Beef is like anywhere from like 80% to 100% of the plate. Right. I mean, yeah. and I was like Brooke more at the beginning or in various stages of carnivore where I would just be hitting one thing super hard and it was fine. I would always feel great. Just like you're saying, you're like, I'm into this for like a few weeks or whatever. And then I would kind of rotate around. And, but once, you know, at this point, it's like, I literally will be dogmatic about telling people, unless you can't tolerate beef, I will tell yeah. people that's the one thing I would tell them is like, let beef be the majority of your plate. And different leannesses right it's like people like some people like fatty beef some people can't tolerate the fat something like brett does the 90 10 ground beef so it's lean but if you don't have beef on the plate i just don't think you're going to achieve the same results on carnivore i would be remiss it has, if I... it has the safest fat because you know unless you're getting really fancy pastured pork and pastured chicken and most people are not you're you know poop is in poop is out you might as well just be eating I don't know, nuts. I just want no, to throw it out there. I don't know if do you guys know BNS at all. Rick, you might have met mm-hmm. BNS. I see yeah, yeah, him yeah. on the platform, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so BNS lives in India and they don't eat. Oh, beef. right, the cow. They don't admit to it. So <laughs> uh, he eats goat all the time and he did. Yeah, really goat will goat, work. Right. And lamb, right? The, the Aussies eat so much lamb. Right. And you're, you're right. I guess, what are they? Is a goat ruminant as well? Yeah. Okay, so ruminant then. Yeah, right. No, quite clearly ruminant's rule. And and I don't disagree with you that most of the people I see successful are doing it on beef, for sure. But I just- We're so fortunate here in the United States. We have good beef here. Right. Yeah, I hear this envy from all over the world. You know, the Aussies were trying, I was sending pictures of my ribeye and they were going to their butcher trying to get similar comparable fatty ribeye. And, and I've heard people say that we have the best tasting beef steaks, you know, in, on the planet, really. I mean, I mean, maybe Japan, right? I guess <laughs> other people have it going on too, but, but we're really lucky. Mm. Yeah. Cause it's sure. affordable here. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can go I mean, buy a ribeye. For- it everywhere, but it might be prohibitive. I go buy a nice big ribeye for five or six bucks sometimes, you know, no more than 10 to get a beautiful steak. And that's a hell of a meal because, you know, you go out and you go buy a burrito or something. It costs the same six, seven, eight, ten dollars. Oh, yeah. Burrito. 
you could just have a ribeye. Who who wouldn't prefer a ribeye? I'm just well, saying. and they, I don't eat out anymore at all because it's like if you go buy your ribeye, you're gonna it's gonna be overseas, and like you said, you might get sick, and then you're gonna spend Little. so much money for this tiny ribeye. And it's like, I could go out for, we used to go out with early carnivore. We would go out and eat carnivore foods at a nice restaurant. And it's like, well, a hundred dollars later, you could have bought yourself a giant ribeye roast, oh right? God, you could have bought the yeah. whole rack. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, That's you could have eaten a uh, prime rib out, like Molly gonna... Schuyler. Who? Molly Is that Schuyler. a play? She's like a food eating champion. And she oh, she, always, she goes yeah. into this restaurant and there's the like previous record holder was like, had eaten like eight pounds of prime rib or something and she's like well uh start bringing it do i have to stop when uh, i break the record and like no you can keep eating she ate like 22 pounds and they ran out of uh they ran out of prime rib <laughs> they had to close the restaurant. Yeah, but you know fighting. i saw I, I saw some stuff on her and um at one point like some videos at one point she's it was just it was killing me she's eating like a gallon she's drinking a gallon of canola oil, oil. Yeah. Or some kind of vegetable. It's like, oh my god, it's so horrible to see her do it because it's gonna be. Just well, that's how she makes a living, you know. Yeah. She'll eat I like a gallon of mayonnaise, too, like out of a yeah. out of a one gallon container, just. Yeah. Disgusting. Yeah, right. Thanks, for things. Better her than us, right? And I make a living by just eating ribeye on film every every day, every day of my life. That should be our goal. <laughs> okay, we have a new business plan. <laughs> Well, I saw some YouTube lady who is literally all she does is smash her face into like loaves of bread and cakes. It's just she just like sits there and just smashes her face and that she's really famous and I believe that's her her main thing. <laughs> like a like a big like a tiramisu or something just sort of Well, not even the ones I saw were not even like, you know, with like frosting or soft. It was just like the mush factor of like smashing your face into like a soft loaf of bread. <laughs> Yes, the fetish we don't know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe there's a fetish around women eating ribeye. Well, I know Emily. Yeah, there's, there's, the, there's the the um, what is it called? The steak model. Have you seen, do you follow the steak model? No, but I want to. Yeah, she's a beautiful young, very young uh, model, and she, it's in New York, and she's eating you know pictures of her eating steak at fancy restaurants. Wow. That we is a should, great gig. We should just yeah. try doing uh, dinner uh, over Zoom while we're eating steak and chit chatting. Why don't we great. do that? Why don't we do that? Yeah, let's do it. We should yeah. have a, we should have a dinner party. That's a great episode. Epidose. Yeah. <laughs> great epidose. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll tell Janice, as she probably doesn't know, I accidentally typed epidose instead of episode one time, and Phil Escott saw it. He's like, "Hey." Uh, you got a typo here and i'm like yeah i went back and corrected it but like once you've posted something youtube won't update it sometimes for weeks oh no you've got me all messed up though tom because when i'm starting out for for the channel i i almost say that every time it's like welcome to epidos ah <laughs> that's all right go with it because you know what what do you what do you, everything's what medicine <laughs> medicine is medicine right and people do these little anal and they analyze the new word and they're like, what? It makes perfect sense. Right. That's Definitely how new out. words are born. I love coming up with, there used to be a new section words. in the Atlantic Monthly. At the, does, did anyone ever read that at the last page? They would do these really fun. I love this. The, the last page was something like, you know, like wordplay and they would have people coming up as a contest. You would invent a word. So for example, what is the feeling of kinship that you feel when you see someone who has the same car on the road? They called it Autobahn, right? <laughs> so that was the, the whole thing was people coming up with new words to yeah. fit this. And I, I love it. I mean, I have all my made up vocabulary that I use all the time for everything. So I'm cool with Epidose. <laughs> awesome. Well, if it slips out, feel, feel like you own it. I'll be like, I'll give you the credit. I'll be like, this is Tom Clark. <laughs> A happy accident. <laughs> like the carnivore. Like the carnivores. I love that word. Oh yeah. It's a great oh I love that. And then who I don't know where the Ruminati thing comes from, but I love that. It just oh, feels so good. Alstead, right? 
Oh, okay. I don't know. I just heard it's something. It's an actual uh, Facebook group. I like to think I invented it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a Facebook group. You could join it. It's great. Really? I would love to. Yeah, the to. Ruminati. Yeah. For I'm real. into it. I like your, and I'm going to grab your ruminants rule. I love it. I love that. So cool. All right. Ruminants rule and ruminants rock. I mean, I think there's a hashtag up there for both of those. Ruminants rock and ruminants rule. Uh -uh. I didn't know that. Yeah. All right. So. Oh, cool. All right. Well, I think we 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 hammered this subject nicely. So, and I think we we got an idea for next week already, and and perhaps we need to plan a uh, a uh, dinner dinner over Zoom. So. Yeah. The carnivore. Yeah, ribs. <laughs> yeah. So we can numb. Oh, we all have to do something. Why well, do I actually do eat with my fingers now? Um, I eat my steak, cut it up, and I eat it with my fingers like an animal. So I'll eat with my fingers on our dinner. It's so easy. You don't even have to cut your ribeye up anymore if you just use your hands. Yeah, that's even better. Yeah, I, if, you, if you don't have any sharp knives, you could just eat it. I don't know if you guys saw, but Emily took a picture. She was sitting in a mink coat, eating her frozen fat with with a pair. Oh. It's chopsticks, you know, the suit, you know, really how she eats it with chopsticks. And I was like, this is some sort of new sort of like uh, adult entertainment here. I, I think, <laughs> think you've invented a new fetish for me. So. Maybe we can do, we can do a new thing on. Awesome. What about like car carna porn? <laughs> we can come up with a new thing. <laughs> I remember when I first became carnivore, um, there was a woman, and I never found out who she was. I was on Instagram and she was like, I think she was in her underwear and she was eating a steak with her hands. And she mm. was like, and there was a whole lot of, of uh, sound. It was like, wow, that's just, it was totally porn, um, meaty <laughs> porn. And I never found her again. I never <laughs> found her again. Well, we'll just and have to- eats that. raw things. She ate like raw testicle and stuff on mine, but it didn't feel like porn. I don't know if sure eating the raw testicle would be a turn on for men, though. I feel like that might be a little bit like jarring. <laughs> right, it wasn't. That's what I'm saying. That wasn't porn. It didn't okay. feel like, like she's eating an eyeball, a raw eyeball, or a raw. Oh. Have you, you know who Azra is? She's from, uh, she's from the Philippines, I think. Or, from, um, yeah, no, and she's and she's really lovely. But the way she does it, she makes everything lovely, like even. Oh eating an eyeball hmm. that takes something That's a, <laughs> you gotta be you gotta be pretty lovely to make that look lovely <laughs> yeah yeah i think she's coming, i think she's coming on for an interview on meet our ex actually I heard. excellent yeah. looking forward to that yeah well we'll wrap it up here and uh so i want to thank everybody for watching I want to thank my two guests for showing up. Sorry, Ray had to go. He had a little no. family stuff to do. But, uh, you know, send this video on to people who enjoy it or maybe benefit from it. Make sure you're subscribed. Stay subscribed. Leave us some comments. We always love hearing some feedback from you folks out there, even the vegans. So even the vegan trolls, you're people too. So till next time, eat some meat, whatever you do. Don't fall Don't down, fall the, down the carpool. <laughs>